Okay, shall we start? Okay, so welcome to the exercise class. So tomorrow, two topics I'm gonna to talk about. First, I'm gonna recap a bit of majorization and we'll see some properties. Um, and then we're gonna talk about optimal cooling again, but from a bit different perspective. So different, different setting we have, when we have one qubit system and we're trying to cool it using a other many level system. And then we'll see what is the optimal way to do so and what is the lowest temperature we can cool it to. Okay, so um, let me start with recapping majorization. And I'll start a, from a bit different point than, than Ralph in the lecture. Uh, so first we'll look at it from the vector point of view. Uh, and then we go to the quantum case uh, and the matrices, Hermitian matrices. Uh, okay, uh, so say that we have two vectors, uh, R and S, which are real valued vectors. And we say that the vector R is majorized by the vector S if uh, there exists the permutation matrices D by D, so the dimension of these vectors are both D. These are permutation matrices. And also some probability distribution, small pj, such that I can write the vector R as the weight sum of the permuted uh, vector S. Okay, so basically what we do, we, uh, we take different permutations of the elements of the vector S, uh, we weigh them with a probability pj, and we get uh, the vector r. So, a uh, simple example, let's just take d equals 2, uh, and consider the vector S, which is 1, zero, and vector r, which is one half, one half. Okay, so how do we see that vector s is, uh, uh, majorizes vector r? So uh, let us take two permutation matrices. So the first permutation matrix We'll exchange uh, zero first and the second element of the vector. And the second permutation matrix will be just the identity, which is also a valid permutation. Uh, then if we write out the sum, uh, given that we take the probability distribution to be um, just half-half, so P1 is half and P2 is also half. Then I write P1, P1, S plus P2, P2, S is equal to just one half. Here we permute, permute, get zero, one, plus one half, one zero, we just get our vector r. And yes. Sorry to interrupt. I, I just noticed that the exercise sheet didn't post that. Okay. It hasn't been posted. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I can post it right now. Probably. Do it in the meeting, yes. But uh, okay. I'll do it in a break. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for noting. Probably just forgot. Um, okay. So, yeah, here, so we write the vector r like that, which means that r is majorized by s. Um, analogously, that, uh, we, can, we can actually show that if we take a vector s, which is any vector of probabilities, it always majorizes the uh, uniform distribution. So now if s is probability vector, 
then it always majorizes the uniform distribution, which is just the vector of R1 over D. So to, the way to prove it is basically similar as here. You just take, you just consider all possible permutations um, that can be applied to the to this d-dimensional vector. You sum them using the uh, uniform distribution, and then you get, uh, as a result, you get the uniform distribution in this weight sum. Okay, so. There are a few other criterions. So uh, another criterion to see whether one vector majorizes the other is the following. So um, let us write the vector R um, in non-increasing non uh, non order, which means I just write its elements such that each element each next element is uh, is not bigger than the previous one. I just rearrange the elements of the vector. Okay. Uh, then we have the following criterion that R is majorized by um, the vector S if and only if the following condition holds. So R1 is less or equal than S1, so on some from J equal one to N, RJ is less or equal than sum of SJ, and so on until uh, the last one is just equal when we sum up all of the elements. So the equality is for, so in principle, if you consider arbitrary vectors, this should be an inequality, but for probability distributions, we write it as equality. Ah, sorry. Uh, no, actually, it's always equality, but for probability distributions, this is just equal to one, so they're both equal to one. So basically, then, how do we check that one vector majorizes the other? We both write them, write them both in the non-increasing order, and then we just check that uh, each element um, of the first vector, the sum of the first n elements of the first vector, is uh, less than the sum of the first n elements of the second vector. Okay. Uh, so now, for now, the vector case is clear, right? Okay. So just one more example. So one can see um, the majorization uh, of the vectors which correspond to the angles of the triangle. So that we have a triangle with three angles, theta 1, theta 2, theta three. And for example, the kind of uniform distribution, so to say, of this of, of these angles is always majorized by any other uh, values of these angles, which is in turn majorized by just pi zero zero, where two angles are zero and one of them is pi, which is not strictly speaking a triangle, but um, still is a, is a case when these three angles sum up to pi. Okay. So now let us go from vectors to just real vectors to quantum mechanics. So why is it useful for quantum mechanics and how we can reformulate it to suit quantum mechanics? So we have say two Hermitian matrices. Um, which we call capital R and capital S. 
And because they're Hermitian, uh, they have very one nice property that their eigenvalues are real. And we can denote their uh, vectors of their eigenvalues as lambda of R and lambda of S, basically their spectrum. And since now we again have two real vectors, we can apply the same <coughs> maturization notion to them. So, and then we say that R Hermitian matrix is majorized by S if its eigenvalues vector is majorized uh, by the eigenvalues vector of S. Uh, so an example or an observation of this would be if you take, uh, say now as a Hermitian mat matrices, we take just the density operators uh, of, for which the, um, the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are basically some sort of probability distribution. Uh, we can see that the maximally mixed uh, density matrix, identity over D, is always majorized by um, any other density matrix. So, now a few important results. Uh, so I'm just gonna state these results here. I'm not gonna prove them, but you can freely use them in solving the exercises or, um, yeah, or understanding the results. So first one is Horn's lemma. And it basically says um, the vector R is majorized um, by vector S if and only if um, and there exists a unitary matrix U with the elements uh, Uij such that I can write Ri as sum over j modulus of uij squared sj, where ri and sj as the, are the components of the vector. Okay, then there is also a Schurhorn theorem, or rather, I'm gonna state here um, a consequence, which is a direct consequence of, of the Horn's lemma. So if I have, uh, if there exists a Hermitian matrix, uh, with eigenvalues lambda j, so lambda i, uh, but the diagonal elements of this Hermitian matrix would form uh, the vector h i, then this is equivalent to lambda uh, majorizing h. So the uh, if if we have a Hermitian matrix which is not uh, diagonalized uh, and just has these diagonal elements here, then they're always majorized by the uh, vector of the eigenvalues. And finally, we have Ullmann's theorem. which is uh, if R is major, uh, so R is majorized by S for some Hermitian matrices uh, R and S, this is equivalent to saying that there exists uh, a set of unitary operations, UJ, 
and a set of uh, basically probability distribution such that R can be written as this probabilistic mixture of applying this unitary operation to the matrix S. So this, of course, is very uh, similar to our initial definition of majorization because basically um, here we were applying some permutation on the vector and here we're just applying some unitary operation to the Hermitian matrix. And the unitary operation is, can be understood as a, um, a generalization of a permutation for, for matrices. Okay. So as of now, everything is clear, right? Results are clear. Uh, if you want to see the proofs of these statements, I would recommend you um, reading Michael Nielsen's notes on majorization, which you can find online. This is the same Michael Nielsen that uh, wrote Nielsen and Chuang's quantum information theory. So these notes I found them very uh, useful, so you can check them out. Okay, so uh, let us do the following. So let us see, let us look at some applications of majorization. So say, look, let us look first at the probabilities of measurement outcomes. Okay, so suppose that we have uh, a d-dimensional system and the state of this d-dimensional system is rho. And we know the eigenvalues of rho, which is this vector of lambda one, lambda d. And so rho in a diagonal basis can be written as sum over lambda j, j, j. Uh, and suppose I, I come and I measure this state uh, not in, in its, uh, uh, no, not in its own basis J, but I measure it in some other also orthogonal basis uh, EK. Okay, and now I want to look at the vector uh, of probabilities of getting the outcome K while measuring in this basis, which is obviously will be given according to the Born rule as just EK rho EK. Uh, now the question is, what is the relation between PK and lambda of rho? So what is the, what is the relation between the vector of these probabilities and uh, the vector of eigenvalues of the matrix? So what, what majorizes what? Uh, can anybody tell me? So remember, we have all these results up there. Um, so if you apply one of them, you arrive to a direct answer. Yes, exactly. Can you explain why? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just a diagonal. Yes, exactly. That's 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 one one way to explain it using the so you basically use the Schoenhorn theorem. Right? The second result. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so one way to explain indeed you take the unitary matrix which transforms uh wrote uh to be uh, to be expressed in the EK basis, and there, of course, these numbers will be just the diagonal, which according to the Schoenhorn theorem would be majorized by the vector of the eigenvalues. Okay, very good. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Now another. question which concerns the post measurement state of a system. So say that again we have a system in a state rho and I apply a measurement to the system and the measurement is described by the set of projectors. Uh, let me use pi because p I use for permutation. And this is a complete set of projectors. So they sum up to identity. Okay, so then the post measurement state, as we know, rho prime would be written as just sum over j by j rho by j. Uh, now the question is what is the relation between uh, rho prime and rho? Which, which state majorizes the other? Okay, this one is a bit more tricky. So uh, what does your intuition tell you in this case? Yeah. Okay, I mean, your intuition is correct. You have to apply the Ullmann's theorem, but you have to, basically what you have to do, you have to find um, a right set of unitaries uh, to apply such that they would give you this state in the definition. And just as a, as a hint, which you can use, is you can set it, uh, you can take a set of unitaries, say UK, where UKs are just sum over J e to the power 2 pi I over N JK by J. And indeed then if you, if you take the set of unitaries, um, yeah, with the correct probability distribution, which you can also find, uh, then you'll be able to express rho prime. Uh, yes. So it's a complete set of projectors, um, and these are orthogonal projectors. Maybe I haven't, so maybe I also write that they're orthogonal. Okay, just, I mean, to convince yourself, you just, you just have to calculate this one, right? right. And uh, there, two things that will appear is uh, pi, so basically it will be either pi j squared, like the, of, the, of the same value, or uh, pi j pi k, uh, which will be zero, because they're orthogonal. Okay. Yeah. And then you get, you get the identity for this. Okay, good. So now let's go to the next uh, definition, which are, which was also mentioned in the lecture, which are doubly stochastic matrices, which also provide another criterion for uh, majorization. So what are the doubly stochastic matrices? Uh, D is doubly stochastic uh, if its columns, um, if I'm not, so first, okay, r columns sum up to one and also its rows sum up to one. So for example, um, such a, doubly stochastic matrix is the following. So if you take T between zero and one, then it's T minus T minus T T. How can we interpret the doubly stochastic matrix? Well, it can be um, 
interpreted as a communication channel. So say that we have some input into the channel, uh, which is described by probability distribution, say PI, uh, and then we have some output from the channel described by the probability distribution, say Q, J, and then I can write uh, QJ as the sum over K, um, the probability of inputting uh, some K into the channel and getting J as the output uh, multiplied by the probability of uh, just putting in, inputting the k into the channel. So this box is basically given by this conditional probability of outputting j given k. And this is exactly the elements. This can be interpreted as the elements of the uh, of these doubly stochastic matrix. Uh, To be to be completely concise, actually, that just that um, condition of like inputting probability distribution and outputting probability distribution uh, is not enough. You because this only um, certifies that one of these um, uh, equalities holds true. To to get the another equality, we also need to uh, specify that. The uniform distribution is the fixed point of the channel. So that sum over J on uh, sum over K P uh, J K is equal to one. So basically if I input here one over D, I should get an output as one over D. And in that case, uh, both of these hold, and this is indeed, uh, can be written as a doubly stochastic matrix. Okay. Uh, and the consequent theorem. So, assuming this is. Okay. Um, is the following. So, D is doubly stochastic is equivalent to saying that uh, dr is majorized by r for any vector r. Okay, so this is another criterion for majorization. So sometimes to prove that one vector is majorized uh, by the other, we just need to find a doubly stochastic matrix that connects them. Uh, however, there is a caveat you shouldn't forget about, which sometimes people make mistakes uh, with, is that if R is majorized by S, then it doesn't mean that dr is uh, majorized by ds for d doubly stochastic. So kind of the intuition here is that um, this majorization condition happens because d somehow mixes the components of this probability vector r. Um, but here, even if um, the components of vector R might be more mixed than the components of vector S. Uh, applying D, so kind of additional mixing to them, uh, does not ensure that uh, this majorization condition still holds because they can mix them uh, like in, in a different way. It's nice if, you, if you're able to find um, kind of a counterexample to this, so just take uh, two two vectors 
uh, you can even parameterize them such that one majorizes the other and try to find the doubly stochastic matrix such that uh, dr majorizes ds. But this I'll leave as the homework. Okay. Uh, so let me make a quick break now since we're kind of finished with uh, our recap of majorization and doubly stochastic matrices. I'll uh, quickly upload the, the exercise sheet in, a, in, in the while and then after that we can talk a bit about optimal cooling. Okay. Shall we continue? Okay. So now we go to the, yet again, another optimal cooling problem. So the setting is the following. So I have two systems again. So one of them is our qubit S. And another system is a d-dimensional system. Um, with the, let's call it B, say, uh, with the levels from zero to dB minus one. And the energies of the levels go from epsilon zero, epsilon one, so on, epsilon db minus one, which we'll call epsilon max. Okay, and the uh, energy gap of the qubit is just Es. Now the question is, or like there are two questions. So first one, uh, what, is the, what is the temperature that we can cool um, the qubit S2. So what is, what is, it, uh, what is the temperature that, um, that we, can, we can obtain uh, cooling qubit S by repeatedly swapping it with some virtual qubits inside this structure? So what is the uh, minimal temperature? And uh, the second question, what is the optimal way to do so? And we will see what, what is the definition of optimality when, when I go a bit into, into that direction, but there we'll use majorization. Uh, so just to remark, this is one of the problems in the course which are actually based on um, papers. So this one in particular is basically the result of the paper, you write the archive number, uh, This is resolved by a group of people, including uh, Rolf. And yeah, this is, the exercise is basically a major result uh, in that field. Okay, but let us first start with uh, what is the minimum temperature that we can cool this qubit to. So let us first remember what we did in our last class. We were swapping the, the qubit with the virtual qubit uh, in other system and after um, an infinite number of swaps, we concluded that we can cool the qubit down to the virtual temperature uh, of that virtual qubit we were swapping it with. So here, uh, just intuitively, what would be the virtual qubit we would need to be swapping with to obtain that bound? Ah, yes, indeed, they're both in their thermal states. Yeah, sorry, uh, good question. Yeah. 
so they're both in thermal states of the same temperature, inverse temperature beta. So say that we take one virtual qubit out of the system, we swap repeatedly um, the system with this virtual qubit, renewing, of course, the virtual qubit every time. Um, which virtual qubit should I choose such that in an infinite limit of application of the swaps, uh, the temperature of this qubit would be minimal? Uh, that's true, but they have different energy gaps. So remember that the th uh, remember the thing uh, about the virtual qubit. It's um, it's the ratio between two uh, two population that gives us the virtual temperature, right? right. And it's the ratio between two populations. Uh, which is which gives us e to the power minus beta v, and then we have the difference between the energies, right? So then it also depends on the energy difference. So we want uh, the maximum possible. Yes. Beta is the largest possible. Yes. Uh, like no, contrary. Actually, yeah. actually, contrary. You would need to take a virtual qubit with the uh, with the largest gap. So, if you take a virtual qubit which is oh, right. just comprised of the, the, gap, the exactly, exactly, yes. So, when we swap between two qubits. Uh, and apply, with the, and in a case with virtual qubit, apply the swap uh, an infinite number of times, then basically to find out the temperature of, of final temperature of our qubit, uh, we just need to uh, use the fact that the ratios of populations for this virtual qubit in the beginning and for this real qubit um, in, in the end would be the same. And this ratio would be for, for the real qubit given by e to the power minus, let's say, let's call this achieved temperature beta star, ES. And the ratio, initial ratio for this virtual qubit would be e to the power minus uh, beta uh, epsilon max. Uh, which means that beta star is beta epsilon max over ES. And one can see that if we take any other virtual qubit from, from, uh, from this uh, d-dimensional d system, uh, the energy in this, in this ratio would be less than E max, so the achieved uh, temperature beta star would be uh, would be less, or the inverse the inverse would be less, uh, which means that the uh, the achieved actual temperature would be higher. So we have wouldn't have coded to the full capacity that we have. Okay, is this intuition clear for everyone? Okay. Uh, it's good to have these intuitions with the ratios about the cooling because this is often a question also which comes up in the oral exam, just as a uh, like quick question to answer. Didn't we sometimes have negative values for beta when the system is very hot? Like, uh, so the negative value for beta will correspond to, uh, I mean, you indeed can have this, um, and, and in this case, it would make it more negative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So exactly. Um, so, no, no, indeed, no. We only, but because we start here from the thermal states, kind of this question 
uh, does not apply to this particular situation. But what cooling usually means uh, in application to the systems is that we're trying to concentrate as much population in the ground state as we can. Sorry, I'm being quite yeah, 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 of course. Like. Uh, we assume, let's say that in, the, in this question, we just assume that beta is bigger than zero. Okay, sure. Yeah. So to be fair, of course, one can, um, aha, okay. Let's explain it this way. So sometimes talking about negative betas is useful when uh, you talk about systems with uh, degenerate levels, right? Or does it? Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, I don't think that's correct. Let's put it this way. Um, like in actual systems in the labs, you would you would rarely have uh, be, uh, like beta being negative, such that more population is somehow concentrated on the excited state than ground state. Right. Uh, because that's something that you, a thermal gas that you can yeah. That. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, like in all these questions, we just take beta positive, mm -hmm. and we stop our considerations there. Okay. Uh, but yeah, but if beta is negative, then cooling, uh, yeah, it's not entirely clear how to define cooling, I guess. Yeah, we, we, just, don't, we just don't look at this situation. Okay, so now a bit about um, optimality of this. So I think this was also in the lecture. If we take two states, uh, two thermal states uh, of a system, so, so the final state of the system S, which we label as rho S uh, star, is basically a thermal state of the temperature beta star, and the initial state is a thermal state of beta, because beta star is bigger than beta, then uh, the, thermal, uh, the thermal state of the temperature beta star majorizes the uh, thermal state of the temperature beta in this case. So the, uh, so the states with higher beta always majorize the states with lower beta. Uh, one can prove it uh, using the uh, definition, one of the definitions of, of majorization. Um, sorry. Um, and this is uh, this majorization criterion is something that we're going to use to define optimality of the operation in this in this in this case. So say that uh, every time I perform a swapping operation, uh, I just generalize it to performing uh, a channel on my system S, and I define uh, such so-called so a single um, operation as C of row S, just applying some unitary on row S and uh, system B, the thermal state uh, at temperature beta. Uh, as the following. So Last, in the last tutorial and also in the lecture, we saw that uh, this is how we were getting the post uh, swapping state of the 
of the system S. So we just apply a swap operation and then we trace out the, the second system out of which we take the virtual qubit. Uh, and here we just generalize it to, let's say each side operation is performing some unitary on the system. And uh, the optimal operation would be such that uh, some operation A, such that N applications of this operation A on the state row S uh, majorize the N applications of any other such channel. So basically, this means that after N applications of, of this desired optimal map A, the system is uh, cooler than after N op op applications of any other such coherent operation. Is this understanding of optimality clear? Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is, uh, first I'm gonna present to you with the optimal unitary, and then I'm gonna outline the proof that is, the full proof is given in the paper, but I'm just gonna break it into, into some intuitive stages and you can try to do it at home as well. Otherwise you can just look in the solutions or you can read the original paper. Uh, and it's fine if you don't manage to do it yourselves because it's a kind of it's a answer to a big research question, and um, it's also fine to just look it up. So I claim that such an optimal unitary operation um, is the following. So say I have a joint state of uh, the system S and B. And what the optimal operation does, it kind of rearranges the eigenvalues of this joint state uh, as largest in zero, zero, tensor product, uh, uh, epsilon zero, epsilon zero state. So subspace are here. Uh, and and so on, second largest in zero, zero, epsilon one, epsilon one, and so on until one, one, epsilon uh, db minus one. Uh, yes. Okay, and I can write such an optimal operation as, let me just write it already acting. on our system. So what I get is just the sum so how do I so let's say I say just lambda um So these are just the ordered angular values of, of this joint matrix. And this one goes into sound zero plus um, I plus DB. And these go into the subspace associated with one one. Uh, sorry, here goes I. Since some of I, here is also I. Yeah, just look at the action of this operation. Convince yourself that it does correspond to this basic, basic permutation of um, of the eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, and then given this operation. we can write what we claim is to be the optimal channel, A of B. And then we prove that it's optimal. And we prove it, and the proof 
consists of the following steps. So first step is we prove that if uh, row one is majorized by row two, then A of row one, ah, sorry, row one majorizes row two, then A of row one majorizes C of row two. Okay, this is the first. Then to prove the this claim, we do it by induction. So first we prove it for n equal one. So for n equal one, we just prove that A of row S majorizes C of row S. Uh, yeah, again, for any C. Here is also for any C. And third, we just use induction. We say, let's say that a n of rho s majorizes c to the power n of rho s. Then actually uh, using the first, uh, the first part of the proof, we can say that a applied to a n of rho s should majorize c applied to c n of rho s since uh, a n over s majorizes c n of rho s, so this, uh, this condition holds. Then it means that, so this follows from one, that a n plus one acting on rho s uh, majorizes c n plus one acting on rho s. And uh, final, final part of the proof that is to show that indeed the application of this of this optimal map A uh, does achieve the cooling bound. So one can show that rho S uh, that the limit of n going to infinity, n applications of this optimal map A to the state rho s will yield the rho s uh, star, which is the thermal state of our temperature region star. Yeah, so, uh, Very good. So this is the basic idea of the paper and the basic idea of the proof. Uh, if you have time, I would recommend you to going through the paper as well. Uh, but just knowing uh, kind of the steps of the proof is already enough. Um, what is interesting about this is that, of course, finding out the exact optimal operation um, and optimal map is... Uh, and proving that it is optimal is a bit complicated, but you can already kind of um, see what is the cooling, what the cooling bound is, just from our considerations of swapping the qubits with some virtual qubit. Of course, which is not optimal, but uh, you can still estimate this bound. Okay, uh, I think that's it for today. Are there any questions? Okay. Yeah, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. Hopefully see you next week.